Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wall of Power Radio Hour. I'm your host, Paul Metza. I'm both delighted and honored to have two powerful, artistic, and socially conscious women in the studio today. Winona Duke is an American environmentalist, economist, and writer known for her work on tribal land claims and preservation, as well as sustainable development. In 1996 and 2000, she ran for vice president as the nominee of the Green Party of the United States on a ticket headed by Ralph Nader. In the 2016 presidential election, she became the first Native American woman to receive an electoral vote for vice president of the United States. She is also the executive director of Honor the Earth, a Native environmental advocacy organization that has played an active role in the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. Carrie Pickett is a photographer, author, filmmaker, producer, director, and cancer survivor. I first became aware of her via her great photo book, Love in the 90s, B.B. and Joe, the story of a lifelong love, a granddaughter's portrait. They are joining me in the studio to talk about their film, First Daughter and the Black Snake, that recently appeared at the Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival. And without any further ado, my guests, Winona LaDuke and Carrie Pickett. Thanks so much for coming today. I'm Honored to uh, have you here. Big fans of both of you. Oh, thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Will you? Uh, I watched the movie last night. It's uh, was over what about two year period, three year period? About two and a half. Yeah. Carrie uh, directed and produced it. Tell us about how the genesis of it, how you met Winona, and uh, how the whole thing started. Well, I met Winona in 1984. We were uh, both 25 years old, and I had been out at the Black Hill Survival Gathering in 1980 and had my life changed by having an opportunity to learn about the true American history from the indigenous perspective. And so I felt like I started some really fabulous friendships out in South Dakota, and I wanted to meet people in Minnesota. And so I asked a friend uh, who lived in and around Winona's reservation at the White Earth Reservation um, to introduce me to somebody. He said, I know just the person for you to meet. Mm. And so he introduced me to Winona and she was wonderful, took me all around. And I have these beautiful pictures of her. And um, there's even one of the two of us. And that set in motion a friendship that has been professional for many, many years because I photographed her as a journalist. When she ran for president with Ralph Nader, I worked with Margaret Nelson on a story for People magazine. And when she was not, uh, chosen to be Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year, I did her portrait. When she fought the genetic patenting of wild rice, I followed her to the Capitol. And so I've been trying to keep my eye on her for many years. And then when Enbridge announced that they were going to do the pipeline in 2013, I knew that she would be facing her most formidable opponent, and I wanted to see what would happen. I, want, I care about that region very much, and so I care about the issue, and also I care about Winona, and I just wanted to see what she was going to do. I was very curious. So this relationship is over three decades old. I'm sure you're great friends besides having a professional relationship. I've known Winona for years. I've been a big fan. Uh, I voted for you and Ralph in 2000. I played an event for the Nader uh, LeDuc uh, presidential team at Northrop Auditorium. Uh, and you can't, if you're interested in the environment and progressive causes, uh, there's no way you don't know about the great Winona LaDuke. That's right. So, when, when, well, no, it's true. I mean, when I was watching the movie last night, right, you know, I do what I do. I'm a guitar player. I play some gigs. I do some benefits. I do this and that. But Winona, she's got, uh, she's all over the country. She's giving speeches. She's writing books. She's at protests. She's leading the charge. Then she's got six kids and this gorgeous garden with all that beautiful corn. And I'm going like, how do you find the, the time in the day to get this all done? I'm busy. I can tell me I'll about it. I get up early. I like to get up early. I like to write in the morning. You what know, time do I you get up? It. Usually around six I get up and uh, I like it because it's quiet and no one's up, you know, in my house. And so I kind of like putz around, drink my coffee, do a little thinking, 
you know, and then I, then I usually get my writing done and I think about what I'm doing and then, you know, but this last few years has been kind of like super fast. I feel like you're like landing airplanes or something like, like mm -hmm. everything is moving at you so fast. And so it's been a real test of my stamina and my ability to like, you know, not, you know, just, just keep going on it. Right. And then, and, and how do not you... Not recommended for the, those who are not robust, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, and how do you keep your spirit up now we you know if we can jump kind of towards the end where you had the <clears throat> when Eng Enbridge uh, uh, pulled out of the pipeline at one time and then they switched over to Standing Rock they want to put the Dakota pipeline in and then they want to do this line three so we could talk more about that but where do you in you kind of have some down moments Winona when you go what what keep what keeps the the, the fire in the faith well, let's just be honest. I mean, first, we live in this beautiful place. I wake up and I live, you know, on a lake in the woods. And you can still drink the water from a spring right by my house. I mean, most of the world doesn't have that gift. I got, you know, wild rice that grows on the lake. I can get sugar from a tree. And uh, the world is beautiful, you know, where I live. And I look out and I'm living in the same place as my great, 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 greats lived. You know, and I'm doing basically the same thing. I feel like the Creator gave, gave me a good life and I, and I want to keep it. And then, you know, so a lot of this is about, I feel like this is the way we're supposed to live. And I feel like this corporation's proposal is an interruption in the perfect world that we have and is, a, is really a bad idea, not just for me, but for like all of us, you know, and so I look out there and then I'm also privileged, as you've noted, I've, you know, traveled the world. I mean, the world, not compared to Miss Pickett here, but I've traveled <laughs> a lot of places compared to anybody on my reservation. Right. And, um, you know, I go out there and I see like this, people have a tough situation. Right. You know, people have a lot, a lot of tough situation. People are more, people are homeless, people are hungry, people don't have water, you know, people are afraid for their lives. And I feel like I'm in a place where I can, I can do my best to make sure that that doesn't happen. And, you know, I, I see this situation other people in, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to do this. And they're in a lot tougher situation than me, and they're still trying hard, you know. So I'm like, I, I'm, I'm in a good situation. I'm going to do it. And, and life on the res is not easy in all these, you know, reservations, too. I mean, it's, they've got their own problems besides the, 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 the greater world. So it, it makes so much sense to me. Clean water, good idea, you know. Um, clean air good idea. It's just, you know, it's kind of how the world has been around for as many years as it, it has yeah, been. Yeah, it's been an important part of life, huh? Yeah, pretty much. About all you need, <laughs> right? The history of, you know, those, those lakes and rivers, those were the highways mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah, well, the Anishinaabe people. Yeah. And, but, and everybody, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, I seems like when I was coming down and um, I started trying to teach my grandchildren to look at the infrastructure along the, the, along the rivers, you know, because there's, oh, and I was, you know, when in my travel, you see that, because there was like, the, in, in, I was in, in New England, I was like that name, New England. It's like not really not that new, you know, but <laughs> they had all these mills, you know, and the mm -hmm. rivers were also the, you know, foundation of, you know, the power. And, you know, that was a whole different kind of power than the fossil fuel er era. And right. there's certainly a lot of destruction of the big dam projects, but at the same time, it's interesting how, you know, uh, people don't think about how much the rivers and the water have defined our lives, you know, and our cultural practice and our, you know, our cities and our economies. And, you know, we have this mother load of the world's water here. And I, I feel like it's really a good place. And, and we have a responsibility. I, I refer to it as a covenant, a covenant with the creator to keep our part of the deal, which is we get to keep hanging out here and we'll do the right thing. Right. You That's know? a great way of looking. And it's really sim simple and an easy way to explain it in this world where you need 10 words or less to get the point across. Now, Carrie, what? Tell us about actually doing the movie. How many people, how many cameras did you have? You probably shot some yourself. Uh, yeah. You know? Well, An understatement. Um, yeah. I, when, I, when I started the film, I didn't really know I was starting the film. I didn't really, it took me a while to commit because I had just finished making The Fabulous Ice Age and I knew that I wanted, which is a, a documentary film, it's on Netflix. It's Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so it's a hundred year history of dancing on ice and one man's quest to save the history. And the person trying to save the history is my uncle. 
wow. who I share a photography studio with over on East Hennepin Avenue. And I became a filmmaker to make that film. I learned how, hmm. to, how basically self-taught. I did a- How old's your uncle? He's gonna be 87 in July. Wow, I'd love to have him on the show. Yeah, oh, he's awesome, yeah. he's super cool. And um, so when I was making that film, oftentimes I would wake up in the night and I would be going, you're making a film about figure skating. <laughs> Why aren't you following Winona? Right. You know, but at that time, she was doing epic work. She's always done epic work. But I really feel that once she started facing Enbridge and starting to save this watershed in northern Minnesota for all of us, I re recognized that this was a huge story, mm -hmm. and that what and what she would do would lay a, p a path for others to follow, and so I started following her. She had a um, a dream, I think she can tell you about about how to stop the oil, which was with a spiritual horse ride. And so in ni in 2014, I started going to the Public Utilities Commission meetings and following the efforts of the tribe and then I filmed her her ride in 2014 and I did a one hour cut edit of that ride and then I followed her to the People's Climate March in New York City in 2014 and I saw that indigenous leadership was crucial to the to the half a million people marching mm -hmm. in that in that uh, march and so I was I kind of like a light bulb went off and I was just like oh well that's just that one ride is not enough I have to go much deeper and so it was really at that time that I committed and um, so I committed and I and I basically attached myself to Winona and I spent really two years filming all by myself. Wow. Uh, there's a couple of scenes where um, I had a young woman, Keegan Zavi, help me um, do some filming. And then I got some footage um, from uh, somebody who works with Winona. And then every now and then I would hand my iPhone to somebody and just sort of say, you know, could you film this for me? And so. Um, there, a couple of Winona's family members have a d second camera credits in the film. So some of this is actually down on an iPhone. Just a few shots. Yeah. Just, just a few. It's a very difficult thing to do a film. I can't tell you how tough it is. And I don't think anybody has any idea when you see that footage on screen how many hours are behind every single minute. And now we'll watch a snippet of First Daughter and the Black Snake. This looks like a really old book, Mom. Yeah, it looks like last century. We're still preoccupied with the early photos of Winona. They're so funny. We're in a situation which is kind of called extreme. It's extreme behavior. That's when you no longer want conventional oil. You instead you want to go get oil from the tar sands in Canada. We've got to basically destroy an entire ecosystem the size of Florida to shove it in some pipelines to down here. Or you want to frack North Dakota, put a bunch of radioactive water and destroyed aquifers out there and see how people can live. Or you want to do some other crazy stuff. I want you to meet two gingers Irish whiskey. I'm Kieran and I'm Irish, so I tend to like a challenge. Why not? I wanted a whiskey to help find me out what's out there. Like, what's really out there? And I found the oldest distillery in Ireland with a water wheel and awards for its small family of whiskies in the middle of Ireland. As I've always seen it, you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So try it. The investment is small and the flavor is big. Now it's perfect for drinking neat. Its character holds up, like the Irish, when the bastards try to get you down. Two gingers Irish whiskey, distilled twice for more character, time for more flavor, and less of the old burn. No litte bastard is carborundum. Don't let the bastards get you down. Welcome back to the Wall of Power Radio Hour. This is your host, Paul Metza. My guests tonight, Carrie Pickett and Winona LaDuke. Winona, tell us about the dream. So I... Uh 
Let's just say I've spent most of my life, it seems like, kind of battling stupid ideas. I will call like a lot of mines and dam projects and power plants and nuclear waste dumps. You know, Excel's fabulous nuclear waste dump in the middle of the Skull Valley Shoshone, uh, the Skull Valley Goshoot Reservation. So I, you know, I, I, I seem to understand these are coming. And I, um, you know, I said, you know, this pipeline project's coming our way, and I really didn't have any idea. And I saw all these pipelines kind of coming our way. And so I had this dream, it was a recurring dream, that we should ride our horses against the current of the oil. Always like against the current and put our power, our prayers down. Our prayers down and our horse power, you know, down. The horse nation was going to do that. And so I um, kept dreaming that. And so I'm a, a horse rider, but I'm kind of like a little cowgirl, mm -hmm. not like a big <laughs> cowgirl. Right. And so... I was a little more ambitious than I had thought. And so first I thought it was for the Lakotas. So I went out to Pine Ridge and I told the White Plume family that does the Wounded Knee Memorial Ride that I thought that this was something they should do for the, to oppose the Keystone Pipeline, the KXL. And they nodded. So that's very good, you know, that's a very good, idea, very good dream you had there. Let us think about that. You right. Know? And so I was like, okay. So I was like, you just let me know. I'll help you on your media. I'll raise some money. I'll, you know, get you some help. I'll ride a little bit with you. And then I, like, waited. And then I realized, um, you know, I was like, you know, what's that called? The burden of dreams? <laughs> um, you know, just about the same time they announced this pipeline coming towards us. That's a great uh, title for a song, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's like they, you know, they announced <laughs> this, this pipeline coming towards us. Right. And I had no idea that was coming towards us. You know, it wasn't announced before that. And they kind of, you know, broadsided me at that. And I said blindsided me and I said well that must be what this is for and so then I rustled up literally every Indian person in northern Minnesota who I knew rode horse and I was like let's ride and then I, you know, just before that I went out and bought a horse trailer and my kids were like you don't have a truck to pull the horse trailer mom I was like but there's Craigslist I will right, find the right, truck right. I will find the horse trailer which is like my my new finding I found at Craigslist you could find anything and then I um was prepared and uh, then we, we started riding us. So we rode actually at that time the proposed route of the Sandpiper, uh, the Line 3, uh, which is in place and super old, and we rode the Keystone Pipeline. Hmm. And we actually, uh, out at Standing Rock this year, we rode um, from Standing Rock to um, Tioga. Tioga, which is where the oil is in coming from for the Dakota Access Pipeline. I said, uh, you know, this is, I'm going to just ride this. And so we did that. Wow. So I, did, I did a little short film on that. You can see that on Vimeo. Yeah. Now what some epic, you know, a lot of epic riding for a girl who was just kind of like a rider with a little R. Did you ride Carrie? Did you ride I did. The first, uh, I could not make it to the first, the 2013 ride because I was finishing my first film. And that was really uh, difficult for me. But the 2014 film, I... I, in, in 2014, I rode, and... She's good. She's a good mm. rider, plus she rides and takes footage. Like, wow. I just kind of, like, ride, and I don't like to do anything like that. Right. I just like to ride and pray or just ride. Like, it's like my moment. But Pickett was, like, filming and riding. Wow. And I know, you know, Winona, uh, with Honor the Earth, um, it's all about all these organizations, whether you're trying to save the environment, save a building like I tried to do, do the Guthrie Theater years ago, tr or you're trying to do a movie, you gotta, you're got to. you not only doing the work, but you're always, you're always trying to raise money, you know. So you just jumped right in. You start filming Winona with this concept uh, for the film, First Out on the Black Snake. So how are you getting your money together for any of the young filmmakers out there? they got to know what you have to do to get her done. Well, I uh, spent eight years doing the fabulous Ice Age and then placing that film on Netflix. I had, uh, I got some of my money back. Wow. Not, you know, maybe half of what it cost me to make the film. Right. Back over a three year period. So you stuck and it right so into the new movie. I just, I had an offer for, for a theatrical distribution actually. So a, a very prominent distributor offered me a 10 city theatrical opening but I knew that all the money would then go into the theatrical opening and mm -hmm. if I if I went with um, Netflix I would have a chance to be able to have some kind of an income so I could f film Winona uh, and so I again. was really self-funded throughout all of it and then at the very end 
in order to do post-production, um, I needed help. And my mother helped me along the way. We will be back with Carrie Pickett and Winona LaDuke after this break. If you've got gear, you need a case. And why not use the best? Alcorn Custom Case was started by Billy Alcorn, who's been in the music business for 30 years. And his small family business, located in the heart of Nashville, has been satisfying customers since 2006. Here are a few of Alcorn Custom Case's famous clients. When you're on the road, your gear has to get there in one piece. Stop in on Billy at Alcorn Custom Case and have a specially made case designed just for you. Alcorn Custom Case can be found on the web at alcorncustomcase.com or stop in at 3215 Ambrose Avenue in Nashville or just give Billy a call at 615-678-6259. Alcorn Custom Case. Don't trust your gear with anyone else. Welcome back to the Wall of Power Radio Hour with my guest filmmaker Carrie Pickett and environmental activist Winona LaDuke. I want to ask about your mother because you're half Jewish. Uh-huh. Did yeah. you see the yoga scene? Is yes, it was phenomenal. <laughs> she was kicking your ass. She totally kicked my ass on the other side. <laughs> But uh, tell us about your mom and dad. That's an interesting story because you grew up on the coast, right? Yeah, I grew up in a, in a small town in Southern Oregon. I want to just go back one, th oh, yeah, go one, ahead. one step and say, so we had this spiritual ride. Yeah. And uh, it's really, you know, it felt like bigger than me. But what I want to say is that uh, one day after we finished our fourth ride, Enbridge announced the cancellation of the Sandpiper. Right. So, you know, I was like, thank you, Creator. Right. Uh, you know, I was wondering about that, but I did it. And so, like, I'm going to keep riding on line, right. on line through. I'm going to keep riding until they're out of the corridor. Hmm. You know, we're not, we're not done. But I just want to say is, like, you have to have faith. Right. You have to have faith. Right. You know, and so I was this, this, my life, and I think all of our lives is kind of a test of your faith. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I was like, I'm going to do that. And so, to your question, um, I was born in East L.A., my mother and father met. My mother is a uh, really gifted artist. She's a muralist, a painter. Um, she's 84, and her paintings are traveling shows everywhere. Uh, she was living in Mexico. She came from the Bronx, first generation, uh, Ukrainian Jew, you know, from working class family. Right. And uh, had been in, uh, you know, art school, you know, met Paul Robeson in really? her... Yeah, I'm telling you, my mother was like at art camp, and Paul Robeson was there, and Charles White was there. Wow, we got to get her on the show. Yeah, my mother is like <laughs> beyond cool. Wow. And then my mother um, decided she was going to go to Mexico and be a muralist. She, so she lived in San Miguel Allende for three years and painted and, and was a muralist. Hmm. A kind of like a vista position or something like that. And then, actually, Diego Rivera came to see my mother. Really? Right, so that's my mother. Wow. Like, my mother's, like, incredibly gifted and, and a so, you know, was, was a waitress in the bar that Louis Armstrong was playing in. That's my mother. Wow. So it's, like, totally ahead of her time, you know. And then uh, she moved back to New York, and she was, you know, being an artist. And my father showed up having hitchhiked from White Earth with some wild rice that he was selling. <laughs> and because um, he was going to go to Hollywood... And he, like, I have these pictures of him that my mother gave me, like, he tried to cross the country, like, in a full regalia. Wow. And, um, <laughs> with wild to, rice. With wild rice. And, you know, he, he came to my mother's door looking for someone else and saw my mother. And they instantly fell in love. And, wow. And, um, you know, so then my parents left um, before I was born. But, they, you know, they fell in love and then they moved to, moved to um um, Los Angeles, where my dad then became an extra in the, in the Westerns. And as you can, you know, see in the movie, my mother says that my f grandfather did not speak to her for seven years. Wow. And then I remember, but I said, the other thing is, is that when he finally met me, he was like my best friend. Hmm. And he was like someone to play checkers with. Right. Someone to follow him around while he was painting. Right. And he was a house painter. And my, and my grandmother was um, a pocketbook maker. Mm. A union pocketbook maker and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Oh. And so I come from, you know, union, you know, working class people. Um, my parents uh, separated when I was young, and my mother uh, moved to a small town in southern Oregon uh, called Ashland, 
which is a really kind of an upscale town, and was at the university as an art professor mm. uh, for many years and just recently retired. And so I was raised there. My stepfather is Peter Westergaard, nice Norwegian. Right, so I was actually raised by a Norwegian dad, which hmm. is probably why I find everybody in Minnesota so easy to get along with. Right, because they right. were actually originally from Minnesota, right. and they moved to the Bay Area. Would you like some coffee and a biscuit while you're here? <laughs> no, but I like I, I got I got the you know the and so um, you know and and um, he is an he was an entomologist and ran an agricultural experiment station. So I was basically hmm. raised in kind of a farming and orchard, and a small town. And then I went off to school, like my one ticket out was really to, to get into a college. And so I, I uh, went off to Harvard uh, when I was 16. And uh, well, you 17. You started college when well, you were 16 16 is when I skipped a grade. And so I actually started when I was 17. I started wow. college, but I, I was admitted at 16. And I uh, went off and, uh, you know, then became politically more active. You know, early on, though, because it was the anti-nuclear movement. Right. And, so you know, so I used to come here and, you know, I know where most of the nuclear power plants are in this country. I know about, you know, Prairie Island. And, you know, I don't know why no one speaks of Monticello. You know, I'm not sure why that's any safer than any of the other plants. Right. And was not too pleased to see Westinghouse um, declared bankruptcy two weeks ago. Hmm. So I'm thinking to myself, like, how many nuclear power plants did Westinghouse build and who's liable for them now? I would right. assume NSP is. Right. But, like, that's like a concern. Which is one of my big concerns with these big corporations is that they just go bankrupt. Right. And then they leave the American taxpayers and they leave all of us with all the liability and all the things we got to worry about, like nuclear waste and, you know, hydrocarbons in our water. And, um, you know, so to me, this, this whole battle is largely, you know, the same kind of epic battle that, that my good friend Ralph Nader has waged, which is kind of do the rights of corporations supersede the rights of people. And, you know, we've, we've turned into a, a country which, you know, obviously is seen out in North Dakota you know, the rights of corporations do. And you, you will shoot people for a corporation's right. right. And that's like what I don't want to see in Minnesota. Right. The problem. The problem so in civil society. When did you end up then in White Earth? How did you end when up? When I graduated from college. Okay. I, you know, I've been out there a few times. And Vernon Belcourt, who you know. Yes. You know, knew. Uh, Vernon Belcourt. Clyde's, is, a, Clyde's a better friend. Right. But the, those are, they are actually relatives of mine. And okay. I would see them. I, you know, as a young woman, I worked for the American Indian Movement. I was kind of their research girl. You know, because I mean, you could you know tell I've spent a lot of time on energy policy research. Right. And so I uh, worked a lot on uranium mining and coal strip mining, and then um, you know I was working at Navajo, and then I was working out in South Dakota at the Black Hills Alliance, uh, fighting the uh, big uranium mining proposals in the Black Hills. And um, that's where I first, you know, Carrie and I first, you know, were in the same place. But um, one day Vernon said, "Why don't you move home? Why don't you move home? Why don't you move home and be, be with your people?" So I moved back when I got out of college in 1981. Ooh. I took a job as principal of the Circle of Life School, um, you know, which was like, you know, I was 23 years old. I was like slightly older than some of those kids. <laughs> <laughs>